military veteran. I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud to have supported U.S. foreign policy with my body and to have been an occupier in both, at that time, West Germany, and Germany is reunited now, and still South Korea. Korea is still divided. What in the world does the U.S. think it's doing with troops stationed in a, about three quarters of the world's countries? Over 130 countries in the world, we have troops permanently on the ground, but the German and Korean occupations are a couple of the longest, and the wars that led to the occupations are very, very old and far from most people's memories anymore. And what in the world makes us think it's okay that we're there? And so much affecting those, those nations and those peoples that we don't have any right to try to run their lives, but we do. That's what an empire does. And that's horrendous. And I'm very guilty for having been physically a part of that, mentally a part of that. But of course, I learned tremendously from it, and you know, it's, it's part of why I am who I am today. I say no to that now, and I think it's important to say no to the evil in the world, to the, the mistakes in the world. I don't believe that there is the embodiment of evil. I don't believe some people are evil. I think we all have tremendous capacity for both good and evil. And a lot of the evil is systems that we just don't feel able as individuals to challenge, but we have to. Um, Alice Walker, a real mentor of mine, I have met her a few times, not spent a lot of time with her, but she says that activism is your rent for being on the planet. And I, I very much agree with that. And there's a lot of ways to be an activist. I'm gonna talk about going to court, but you know, Speaking out wherever you are, with your family, with your church, with your class, speaking out, questioning things is important however you do it. I do a lot of lobbying, even though the Congress is pretty hopeless, but I live in Baltimore and I am experienced lobbying, so I go to DC pretty often. And mostly I know that it's simply telling those goops in Congress that there are people who strenuously disagree with them. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much all that's happening these days, but I still think it's important. And I, I help to teach other people how to do it. Um, you know, at least theoretically we have a democracy and, and the citizens of a democracy are supposed to know what's going on and, and talk about it and interact with their elected officials. And, Yes, it's probably mostly pretty pointless at, at this day and age, but we go through the motions and maybe a few hearts and minds will be changed and, you know, that's, that's all we can hope for with anything we do, however we do it. Um, as, as everyone here, I'm sure, you've been called troublemakers. I've been certainly called a troublemaker for bringing up difficult questions and, and speaking out and saying no. And I say, well, no, I'm not a troublemaker. I'm very clearly not making the war. I'm not making the poverty. I'm not making the, the imprisonment. I'm challenging them. I'm questioning them. I'm saying no to them. I'm a trouble pointer outer. I'm not a troublemaker. <laughs> Except that, of course, we're all responsible. But you know, as best I can, I'm saying no to those things. I'm pointing them out. I'm reminding you that they exist. I'm not making them. So don't call me a troublemaker. Um, I want to do a couple of handouts so that I won't forget about it later. The first one being, and I'm going to have to do it without the mic. The Transform Now plowshares, John just mentioned it, my, our dear friends who went into the, the Oak Ridge nuclear weapons plant and cut through four fences wrote peace slogans on the wall, poured human blood on the wall, and chipped off just a tiny bit of the corner to literally embody Isaiah's prophecy of beating swords into plowshares. That's what plowshares activists do, is physically damage weapons and weapons facilities. And, and I was very honored to be closely involved with the planning and the carrying out of that event. These postcards are to the judge who will be sentencing Megan and Michael and Greg. The, the schedule now is September 30th in Knoxville, Tennessee, and you're all invited, of course. 
there will be probably several hundred of us there in support in court when the, the sentences are, are passed down. And it's, of course, important to be there in support. And the postcards are to the judge. They're asking him to reject the legal requirement that he not differentiate between a terrorist and a peace activist. And that's the first thing he said after the prosecution, after the jury went out and the prosecution had said to the jury, we're not asking you to call these people violent. They're obviously not violent. They're obviously very gentle people, but they damage government property and government policy, and therefore you have to convict them, which they did. As soon as the jury walked out, the prosecutor turned to the judge and said, Your Honor, they were just convicted of sabotage. That is unavoidably a violent crime. You must lock them up. You cannot let them be out until sentencing. And the first thing the judge said was, Congress was really doing a bad job the day they wrote this law. I really don't like not being allowed to differentiate between a terrorist and a peace activist. He knows that. He said it from his gut. And then he backed off because he's ambitious and a Bush appointee and young and, you know, there you are, he's in the system. But anyway, the postcards go to the judge. Please fill out your address on the front, your, your written signature on the back, and give them back. Trying to avoid killing too many trees, there are only 25 copies of my article, but you can get it online from me later if there aren't enough for all of you. Resistance and I do call it civil resistance, not civil disobedience, because I highly respect and would love to do civil disobedience when that's appropriate. Civil disobedience is disobeying a law, and it may be a, an unjust law, there are many, but still. For instance, the civil rights activists the, the young African Americans in the South in the 60s sitting in at lunch counters where they were legally prohibited from being served. It was a local ordinance, not any big deal, but it was a law that they could not legally be served there and they broke the law by sitting down and asking for a cup of coffee or whatever. And they proudly broke that law and they proudly, proudly filled the jails and that's wonderful. But how do you do that? How do you break the law that allows for war? You can't. The whole system allows for war. And it is the government that is breaking both international and domestic constitutional law by war making. So it would be hypocritical to pretend that we were breaking a little law instead of pointing out the government's law breaking. And this is a fairly small part of, it, part of it, but it's also a point that's important. A lot of the legal system has absorbed the idea of civil disobedience and, oh, if you do civil disobedience, you proudly have broken a the law, therefore you're guilty, therefore why are we bothering with this trial? Judge just locked them up. Locking, being locked up is not the end of the world. I have done jail time, but it is important to be clear that when you do civil resistance, you are resisting your government's illegality. And it is important for those of us with the privilege of whiteness, middle classness, a good bit of education, a lot of us, it's very dangerous for a lot of people to be mixed up in the legal system. The people who've been in solitary for sometimes decades, what an atrocity. The people in Pelican Bay, California, who are on hunger strike challenging the prison conditions in this country. We know Bradley Manning was held in solitary for months and woken up every five minutes. I mean, I'm sure he wasn't asleep, but bothered every five minutes, supposedly because they had him on suicide watch. That's torture, that's abuse, and that's hideous. And, you know, poor people, people of color, a lot of people are at great risk if they get tangled up in the legal system in this country, the illegal system, the, the court system. But white folks with some standing and some um, relative privilege, it is a privilege that we should use to challenge the illegality of our government if we're able to do that. I don't dragoon anybody into it, but I certainly want to support people who are perhaps able to challenge our system through the legal system. 
And, you know, many times the judge just laughs and says, of course you're guilty and you're going away. Or more often they want fines, but, you know, Cynthia Bannis is absolutely right. I don't think she's here, but she said in the, in the morning plenary, you know, the, the so-called legal system, the judiciary system is totally broken. Is it really valid to challenge it anymore? She may be right that it may be totally down the drain any minute now, but I don't think it quite is yet. And I'm, it is a privilege also to be able to, to not have responsibilities, daily responsibilities. So if I go to jail, that's okay. Um, it, that is definitely a privilege, but I, I find it important to use. It's a piece of what I do. And getting a jury trial, which means you do a, a somewhat more serious crime or action um, because you have to be charged, you have to be facing, depending on where you are, six months or a year in jail potentially is the maximum to get a jury. And that's, that in itself is a, a terrible destruction of what the Constitution originally meant. You're supposed to be able to get a jury trial no matter what the charge is, but that went away long ago, partly just out of expense and trouble. And you know, yeah, of course, we don't want to take too much trouble. But partly out of keeping the poor people, keeping the, the little people who are going to be charged with little piddly stuff like loitering and, and you know, disturbing the peace to keep those people from really having access to any real justice, the justice of their peers. And it, that's another piece of, of the Transform Now Plowshares trial that's just happened. Were they judged by their peers? Well, of course not. They were judged by workers at the plant who, of course, were going to find them guilty and be angry because they disrupted the system, which pays them fairly well to create weapons of mass destruction. And, you know, the, the, Megan and Michael and Greg are not individually blaming the workers. They sympathize with the workers and want, that's the name of the action to transform now plowshares. Transformation, not only of the bombs into something useful and life-affirming, but the system to be useful and life-affirming and people's lives to be useful and life-affirming, to transform the whole world, really. Megan speaks of it so eloquently. It's so, you know, it wasn't just an accident. That name is very important, the Transform Now Plowshares. I have not yet done a plowshares action, but I have considered it, and who knows what the future might bring. I, I highly respect the folks who take that great risk, because it is a great risk. They possibly face 30 years in prison. It's not likely they'll get that heavy a sentence, but that is the maximum recommended sentence for the two things they were convicted of. But again, back to, back to my theorizing about the process of doing civil resistance or civil disobedience. Resisting our government's crimes, resisting what our government does in our names, we do it, we all do it in many, many ways, including simply speaking up among friends and family. But if you can, I think it's still important to go to court. I think theoretically we have a good system. And of course it's been diminished and twisted in so many ways. And you know, our government doesn't feel like there's any, any break on it at all. But Look at how terrified they were by the occupations, the occupies, a couple of years ago, and how terribly, repressively they broke up those camps. And that, for the most part, wasn't any law breaking. There, there were actions that the occupy folks did, um, you know, marches and vigils and sit-ins and, and things like that. But the majority of the occupy folks were simply there in the supposedly public square, and that terrified the system. And they got rousted out pretty quickly. They're really afraid of us, y'all. <laughs> they really are. They're afraid of our thoughts. They're afraid of our talking to each other. And 
if you can, challenging them in their own system, which of course has always been set up to, to benefit the wealthy over the poor and the, the educated over the uneducated and the, the people with the right skin color from everybody else and all of that. I mean, you know, the whole world is that way, so why would we imagine our, our legal system would be any different? But at least theoretically, in this country, our constitution that, that Ray McGovern was talking about, I was a soldier too, and I took that, that oath too, to defend and protect the constitution from enemies foreign and domestic. And throughout my life, I think there have obviously been shooting wars, and, and in the moment there were foreign enemies who threatened the lives of the people who were holding guns on each other. Yes, of course, but largely that was because the U.S. instigated those wars. Wars make a lot of money for the arms merchants. You know, this country hasn't been invaded for over 200 years. Where in the world do we get this massive sense of, of looming threat from everybody else? Well, they hate us because of what we do to them, not because we're supposedly a democracy. So I took that oath, and yes, as, as Ray said, they don't take it back. You don't say, I now renounce my concern for the Constitution because I'm getting out of the military. It never goes away. We took that oath, and we still respect it. The Constitution, like everything humans do, is imperfect, but it was, for its time, over 200 years ago, pretty forward-thinking, pretty progressive, and a lot of U.S. history for a good while was the broadening of what the Constitution applied to and, and who it was for. Yes, it was landed white men, rich white men. Somebody said yesterday that that was about 13% of the population that the Constitution actually applied to when it was initially created. And because of labor unions, because of the, the suffrage movement, because of the abolitionists, because of a lot of struggles, which included, up to and including, civil resistance or civil disobedience, and speaking out in so many ways, the brave people who, on whose shoulders we stand, the broadening of the U.S. Constitution is an important part of our history. And I'm proud of that. I'm not proud of what this government has ever meant, but I am proud of the struggles that have gone on by citizens, and I'm proud to be able to participate in it in my own way, and to challenge it in court, to use that sick system, and it is a very sick system, but theoretically, it's not a bad idea to, instead of just lopping somebody's head off because they did something the king didn't like, to require that they have someone to represent them, someone who understands the system and can say the right words and advocate for them alone. And yes, we all know of somebody who got off on a technicality and that's not fair. There's, you know, criminals walk in the streets because the legal system is manipulative. Well, yeah, that happens. But for the advocate, for the attorney, to be for that person, and the other side has the responsibility to be for that person, or whatever they're arguing, it's often, you know, the government or the state. But for, the, for that system, that adversarial system in court, given the fact that, that so much of our life is, is created to be adversarial, it's, it's not a bad idea, and you know, we, we hope to make it better over time. But <coughs> using it, making the arguments in court, and occasionally winning, I have been acquitted by a jury of my peers. Um, some of us, if you've been in the Hart Senate office building in D.C., the, the congressional office buildings mostly are very antithetical to, to doing anything, but wearing your feet out walking down the marble halls. But the Hart Building has an eight-story atrium and balconies over which you just are dying to drop huge banners with wonderful slogans on them. And a, a big lobby where you can raise your voices 
And interestingly, the offices back up to the balcony, so they're not really going to hear you much or be very disturbed. But you can really speak out there and do great actions. We did an action. We're pretty quiet, actually. We set up a mock graveyard with tombstones with photos of US soldiers and Iraqis who had died in the war in Iraq. And we were reading names, so it wasn't very loud. But it was a beautiful visual. And in court, because it was a six month or, or worse possible sentence, we did get a jury. One of the jurors chosen toward the end of the, the selection system for the jury because the government had used up all their strikes. They couldn't get rid of this jury candidate. She was a reporter for Al Jazeera. <laughs> and so we knew we had a very good chance. And sure enough, she was one of three members of the jury who said, I'm not going to convict these people no matter what the judge says about what the law is and how we have to follow the law. No, I am not going to convict these people. The Al Jazeera reporter, and she was not an Arab woman, she was a Canadian woman actually, but reporting from an Arab point of view, she of course had sympathy for the atrocity of killing Iraqis for no reason at all, except the lies we were told by Bush and, and his cronies and continue to be told by Obama. I don't want to lay that all at Bush's feet at all. Um, one of the other jurors who wouldn't convict us was a local businessman, which was interesting. And, you, know, you never know where people are coming from, no matter what the facts of their life and who you think they are. And uh, so that was exciting. It, the system can work sometimes, and that gets to the idea of jury nullification. How many of you know what jury nullification is? Hey, wow, what did I saw five or six hands, that's fabulous. This goes way back. The US judiciary system is based on English common law, back to the Magna Carta, back to taking some power away from the king and taking some to the people. And again, it was landed white men who did that. And the English system has struggled to broaden the rights for more people, not just the, the property owning white men just like the US system has. But juries have the right and the responsibility to look at the facts, all the facts, not just the few that are allowed to be spoken about during the trial, and to look at everything. What did they do? What did it mean? Why did they do it? Even though the law, as the judge pronounces it, says, X, Y, Z, jurors are allowed and, and have the responsibility to look at what's really justice. And if they have the courage, and it does take courage because they're not educated about jury nullification, they're often all but told, you must not do anything but what I tell you as the judge. They have to have the presence of themselves to be able to say no. We see what's just here, even if the law says X, Y, Z. God bless the jurors who can do that. It's rare. And I think it's a tremendously important idea to get out there further. But again, back to the idea of civil resistance or civil disobedience. We argue in court that we have the right and the responsibility, especially based on the Nuremberg principles, which the US rammed through because they were angry at Germany and, and couldn't imagine that these ideas would apply to anybody but those loathsome Nazis. Citizens were wrong not to speak up. German citizens were wrong not to speak up and speak out. Actually, a good many of them did, and those stories are deeply buried now because the system doesn't want us to know that nonviolence absolutely can work. There were women in Munich in the 30s, whose, they were Aryan women, but they were married to Jewish men. Their husbands were rounded up and thrown in jail in Munich. They didn't really have the, the concentration camps so totally set up yet, so they couldn't just stick them on a train, but they were holding them kind of pending probably that process of, of dragooning confessions from them that we heard about earlier. 
And once they had that in writing, they would individually execute them. And the wives stood in the courtyard in front of the prison in Munich for days and weeks, and they got their husbands back. And I don't know individually what happened to those husbands after they got them back. I hoped a lot of them, wives and husbands and children, all fled. But obviously that was difficult in those years. But they did get them released. And the whole nation of Denmark resisted the Nazis and lost almost none of their Jews. They simply, they from the king on down said, no, we're not going to separate them out to wear the yellow stars. The king said, the king wore a yellow star and the Nazis threatened that they would kill the first non-Jew they recognized who was wearing a yellow star and he said, no, it was the flag, I think, the Danish flag. Who's going to be flying that flag? We'll shoot the man. And the king said, that soldier will be I. But the whole nation, from the king on down, resisted the Nazis, and almost none of their Jews were deported and killed. They rode a lot of them across the narrow connection between Denmark and Sweden. It was possible to resist even the quintessential enemy, Hitler. But we don't get told those stories. But it does work, we can do it, and they desperately don't want us to know that. And as I've tried to make very clear, I do it in many, many ways. But part of how I do it is to still push a system which is deeply flawed from the creation and deeply broken now, but to still, as a white middle class person with relative privilege, and access to money, although I have not been employed myself being a full-time activist. My husband's a retired physician, so we got plenty of money. And, you know, those privileges I want to use, and one of the ways I want to use them is to use a system which, at least theoretically, is a pretty good system. And I'm pretty safe in it. They might beat me up in prison, but it's not nearly as likely that I would get beaten up and, and seriously, maybe life-threateningly abused as a poor woman of color who's in there for a ridiculous drug charge or whatever. So I, I want to use that privilege every way I can. And the system totally doesn't understand, of course, privileged people taking a risk with their, their job or their home or their standing in the community. They don't get that at all. It just kind of shakes them. So. You know, just that, saying, no, I disagree with you so much that I'm willing to put my body on the line and you may put me in jail. You think that's the worst thing, or one of the worst things you can do. Uh, obviously not execution, and you know, even we may even get to that. We are definitely well into fascism. I don't disagree with that. But for now, I think it's still relatively safe for those of us with relative privilege to challenge the system up to and including disobeying. Now another thing, how many of you know who Brian Wilson is? Good, most of you. The Wilson with two L's, of course, not the Wilson with one. The Wilson with one L was a beach boy, one of the singers. <laughs> Brian Wilson with two L's was the Vietnam veteran who resisted in Vietnam, really questioned, uh, was sent away, sent out of Vietnam early because he questioned so much and they just, they sort of wrote him up, but they didn't prosecute him. They sent him back to the States kind of thinking he probably would eventually be prosecuted and because the system is, is very inexact, they just sort of let him get on out of the military and he's been a resister in many ways ever since. One of the ways was to put his body in front of a weapons train in California during the Central America era, and the train ran him over, cut off both his legs. He ended up getting a fairly large financial settlement from the government for that assault, and he used that money to travel to places where the U.S. was being particularly abusive around the world, including to Iraq. The first time I went to Iraq was with a delegation Brian put together in 1991, six months after the Gulf War. That was my first time there, and that was an incredible experience, which I'm not going to go into more right now. But Brian, I think, is experiencing a lot of guilt, actually. I don't think he should, but I think he is. 
he and his wife, Becky Luning, live in Portland, in Portland, Oregon, in the city, but they live almost off the grid. They have a, a fairly large yard, which is all raised beds, and they grow most of their own food, and they have solar and wind energy. I don't think they're totally off the electric grid, but pretty close to it. And Brian refuses to fly, so he won't do any more of the international delegations because flying is so atrociously abusive to the environment. He mostly gets around locally with a hand cycle. Of course, he can't use a, a more traditional bicycle because he's got artificial legs, but he uses a hand cycle. And he's in his 70s now. Partly, I think he keeps doing it because it keeps him fit. He wants to hang in there as long as he can, but also because it's something he can morally do and he rides a train when he needs to to get around. He, was, he has a wonderful book called Blood on the Tracks that was published several years ago, and of course he has